You've made it to the final lesson in module four. In this lesson, I'll reveal to you how sneaky bondage really is and how when you fall for its sneaky tricks, you're guaranteed to stay stuck. Let's begin. So we now know that bondage seduces us with the word should, put another word, put another way, um, with a very disempowering definition of responsibility. I want to shine a spotlight on bondage a little more um, and not only look at what it's trying to seduce us with, manipulate us with, but also what its dirty little secret is. Any thoughts about what bondage's dirty little secret is? It's only in your mind? I'll tell you. Oh, go ahead. It's only in your mind? Ooh, I like it. Yeah, pretty much. This is the way I put it. Bondage's dirty little secret is that it's always trying to convince you that the way you feel is about the thing you feel is persecuting, persecuting you. I'm going to read it one more time. Bondage's dirty little secret is that it is always trying to convince you that the way you feel is about the thing that you feel persecuted by. And it does this, this, let me rephrase that. It's doing this to keep us stuck. And of course, I'm just personifying bondage. <laughs> but... We're just going to call it it for right now. It knows that if it can convince us of this, we will stay stuck, period. Let me show you the logic of this. I'll let you finish writing, though. So the reason it's trying to do this is it knows that we'll stay stuck if, if, if we continue to think this. Here's the logic of it. I feel this way because of this thing. So bondage has done its job. It convinced us, it's really sneaky, convinced us of this thought, I feel this way because of this thing. So then it's only logical to think, oops, there we go. It's only logical to think that if this thing is making me feel this way, it must be bigger or more powerful than me. This, that's only logical. If something is making you, if you think something is making you feel a certain way, it must be bigger than you. There's no other way you can make number one, lo number one work. So it keeps us stuck. We only have this option. If this thing is bigger or more powerful than me, then there's really nothing I can do about the way I feel. Or if this thing is bigger or more powerful than me and I want to feel better, I must go to war with this thing. Keeps us stuck. And what are the things we feel persecuted by? Well, after reflecting on my own life and countless coaching calls, I would say I think it's pretty accurate to narrow the, our main persecutors down to four. And this is in no particular order. Time, money, your body, or other people either how they're treating you or what you think they think about you. And so it begs the question, if you either can't do anything about the way you feel, you just have to surrender to the persecutor and you can't do anything about it, or the only way you think to feel differently is to go to war with it, it begs this question, and I didn't come up with this question. I can't remember who to credit it to, but it's a fabulous one. If you're at war with fill in the blank and you win, who loses? If you're at war with time and you win, who loses? If you're at war with money and you win, who loses? If you're at war with your body, 
and you win, who loses? If you're at war with other people and you win, who loses? My point here is that even going to war, so if we go back here, if we think that the way you feel is about the thing that's persecuting you, so we start with this logic, the way I feel is because of this thing. Again, the only logical thing that makes sense is that that thing must be more powerful than me. And so we only have two options in that case. You surrender to the thing more powerful or you go to war. But it's still, the surrendering doesn't do anything about the way you feel. But you think, maybe I could go to war with the thing and feel different. But if these are our main persecutors and we go to war with them, we're losing in that fight. If you win over your body, what does that even mean? If you win over money, something that you want to use as a form of engagement, what does that mean? If you win over other people who could really contribute to your life, who you could compliment, what does that mean? So you see how it keeps us stuck, this dirty little secret. So both sides of the scenario, either surrendering or going to war by the thing you feel persecuted by, um, would you agree they're not true solutions? Okay. So let's go back to this conversation. Then we would have to say, if they're not actually get bringing us more balance, it's not a true 180, but we constantly feel like we're doing this, then going to war or surrendering would logically go here. To persecutor. Here, you have... Um, Hmm. Okay, so here you have the, the thing you feel persecuted by. So the thing, persecutor. So what we're typically doing is we feel this thing, we go to war or we surrender. We feel this, this we think this thing is the problem, we go to war or surrender. But remember, the things that we label problems aren't always accurately labeled. What if this thing, the way you feel about time or money or your body, is just a conversation starter? Making the real problem and the real solution, if we believe in the fact that bondage and freedom are on the perspective, column, not on the action, or excuse me, axis, not on the action axis, then what if um, chronic disempowering perspectives are the real problem? And what if the real solution is not war or surrender, but empowering perspectives. Now, let's let's take a look at how sneaky bondage really is. Here we are on the perspective axis. We feel like there's a problem, and what does bondage try to do? Tries to have us take action. And so the ability to actually solve the problem goes away. It distracts us from the actual problem. Because wouldn't you agree that if perspective is the uh, problem, or I should say that, if bondage is the problem, 
and it's on this axis, then we would need to stay on the axis to actually solve the problem. Just, it's logical, right? We've got to, um, when we switch axes, is that the plural of axis? We'll go with it. When we switch axes, axi, <laughs> then, then we're distracting ourselves from the true problem. Now, what I certainly don't mean to imply is that action isn't sometimes um, important. So, for example, let's say you feel, soup, you feel really in bondage at your job. Maybe you leave your job, it allows you to have different perspectives, you get a better job, right? Or maybe at your current work, you adopt more empowering perspectives, and then you leave. So it's not about only having a, a shift in perspective and not taking action. My point is, if you don't take act, or excuse me, if you don't shift your perspective, nothing is really being resolved. So let me put it to you in this way. Okay, so if bondage is trying to get us to take action when we feel it, so let, let's put this here. We feel bondage. And it's using its dirty little secret on us. It's pretty sneaky, and it's whispering in our ear, take action. But it's not even on the same continuum. It's a distraction, a, maybe a temporary relief. I hate my job. I'll leave my job. Temporary relief. If we actually want to um, start a conversation, if we actually want to know what the imbalance is about that bondage is trying to teach us, again, we've got to stay on the same axis. So it only makes sense that this is about, once again, perspective. And the, the balance, the solution, is going to be perspective, too. To switch axes is not, does not make sense. And look at how similar it is to mood and set point. Our, the conversation we had last night, this morning? Can't remember. <laughs> yeah. Bondage, mood, this makes sense. Because bondage perspective is on the feeling axis, right? You have a perspective, you have a feeling. So we could say that's a mood, right? We often try to change our condition to change our mood, action. What's actually required to elevate our mood in a consistent way, when we talked about happiness, set point, trait, is practices. And a lot of times, especially when it comes to bondage, those practices have to do with how you're thinking, your patterns of thought. From chronically disempowered to chronically empowered. So once again, it's not about only perspective, no action. It's about owning the power of perspective. Because if you're constantly taking action, trying to change your conditions, without doing this work as well, vicious cycles. It's really important to wisely decode messages. So bondage is not a problem when we know it's just a message. When we feel bondage, but then be logical about it. If it's a message about bondage, it's not about action, it's about perspective. At some point, before or after the action, I've got to engage with my perspective a little bit, or nothing really is changing. It's going to be as a, a quote, I can't remember who says it, different faces, different places, same essence, same experience. Would you agree? Have you had that experience? Different faces, different places. And I think Albert Einstein sums it up so well in this quote, you can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we use to create them. You can move stuff around. <laughs> I like the, the analogy of you can move around furniture in a burning house. still going to burn. Or you could put out the fire first and then address the furniture. You can't truly solve problems if you're thinking the same way about them. So take a deep breath on that. So let's look at what started this whole thing in the first place. I feel this way because of this thing. We, we now know not the truth. 
The truth is I feel this way. It's really an imbalance of, of perspective. And then the second one, if I feel this thing, if, if this thing is making me feel this way, it must be bigger or more powerful than me. So at that point, we're giving our way of our power. And I want to address that in our definition of responsibility. So if the first definition was all about hanging out on the bondage side of the equation, then unfortunately, in this silly definition, you give away power. You give away your power. On the other end of the continuum, you reclaim power. You might even say you own your own power. So when, it's, when you're not feeling it, you reclaim it. When you are feeling it, you own it. And that's not only responsible, that's kind. When I own my power, I take nothing away from you. When you own your power, you take nothing away from me. So, let's end by talking about how um, the steps I typically use to, to shift um, when I'm feeling in bondage to actually get to freedom. And there's three to five. And it starts by just acknowledging your feelings. Excuse me here while I find this. So simply being honest with yourself, I feel crappy. I must have my bondage lenses on. Feelings are guidance. And you might be tempted to beat yourself up about noticing something negative within yourself, but I, ooh, I love this quote. Encourage yourself by remembering that any detection of negativity within you is, is a positive act, not a negative one. Awareness of your weakness and confusion makes you strong because conscious awareness is the bright light that destroys the darkness of negativity. Honest self-observation dissolves pains and pressures that formerly did their dreadful work in the darkness of unawareness. That's what we're trying to do, just illuminate dysfunctions that you weren't aware of and give them the proper label. This is dysfunctional. This is functional. Okay. This is so important that I urge you to memorize and reflect on the following summary. Detection of inner negativity is not a negative act, but a courageously positive act that makes you a new person. So first step, I feel crappy. I must have my bondage lenses on because feelings are guidance. So the next step that I usually take is to, um, well, and, and, no, let me stop right there. Okay, so the next step I usually take is just to acknowledge what I feel persecuted by. And remember, we've got four persecutors, uh, four main ones, money, time, body, other people. So I feel persecuted by, and remember, if you can't get there, start with the specific and see um, what's really behind it. So... I feel crappy because this, 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 and this, and ask yourself what's really behind it. Well, I would change that if it wasn't to do with, so it might be, I feel crappy because um, my coworker, uh, you know, is, is treating me in an unkind way. And you might feel actually shackled to money with that because you would leave if it wasn't for money. So then you just say, I feel in bondage to money. Because you don't really care about how your coworker feels about you, you just want to leave. But it might be that you think your coworker thinks poorly of you. And, and think about that. You think your, your coworker thinks. That's what we do. I think he thinks. It's, it's funny, right? And so 
we, you just have to narrow it down to the main persecutors. And again, that's just to get general. So none of this is about suppressing feelings. This is all about using them, consciously uh, being aware of them, and then cultivating, or I should say, deciding what we want to do with them, which, in my opinion, is cultivating different perspectives. So in the second point, we're just trying to go from specific to general. I feel persecuted by. I feel in bondage to. And that might be, or excuse me, the, the third step where you might start, stop is I'm not going to fall for bondages, sneaky tricks. I know what's going on now. When I'm ready, there's power to reclaim here. You might not want to reclaim your power. That's fine. You might not know how to reclaim your power. Totally fine. You might just stop there and then go back to your everyday life. Totally fine. Doing these three steps alone, which literally takes seconds, can have a massive impact on your life. Acknowledging how you feel and recognizing that that's guidance. In a general way, acknowledging what you feel persecuted by so that you kind of el you give your you take some momentum away from the specifics. And then acknowledging there's power to reclaim here, but you don't have to actually do it. I love the quote. If you begin to understand what, you're, what you are without trying to change it, then what you are undergoes a transformation. We often think we've got to do all these crazy things to transform, but transformations are actually pretty simple, and it <laughs> starts with awareness. So again, just acknowledging what you're doing with awareness and through the lens of what's actually going on, what's functional, can change everything. But, and, if you want to take it two steps further, oops, we can do what we did before and try to flip it into freedom with a question. So you start by acknowledging you're here. You move up towards freedom by getting more general. You realize there's power to reclaim, and then if you want to make a flip, like me putting on Phil's glasses, you know, his are here, I'm here, it's just a little flip, you ask a question. And again, it can, it can be as simple as, similar to what we talked about before, what if I didn't feel persecuted by my coworkers? What if it's possible to feel free in regards to my coworkers? Wouldn't it be fun if I felt more free when it came to fill in the blank? And then finally, once you've flipped into here, you just keep talking to yourself in a general way about it. So basically, you're just trying to uh, anchor it. I would say you're just trying to uh, myelinate it, you're trying to have more sledding hills go down, you're literally trying to have your brain create a pathway. So you just, you just talk to yourself. So um, it might look something like this. It comes from Dale Carnegie. I realize now that people are not thinking about you and me or caring what they said about us. So this would be if you felt in bondage to what, what you think other people are thinking. They are thinking about themselves before breakfast, after breakfast, and right on until 10 minutes past midnight. They would be a thousand times more concerned about a slight headache of their own than they would about the news of your death or mine. How true is that? And, that, and that's not because we are bad people. We're just supposed to be the stewards of our own life. So other people are important parts, but we're always just concerned about what's going on in our world, right? And so the same way you're concerned about what's going on in your world, and it is your world, so is everyone else. So even if they're thinking about you, it's super minor compared to um, what you're catastrophizing. And I, I love, too, that even when people are thinking about you, they're really thinking about themselves. So let's say you did something embarrassing in a yoga class or something. What they're saying in their mind is, oh, my God, I'm so glad that wasn't me. It always comes back to that person. Everyone's always thinking about themselves. Okay? 
Now, I want to teach you, to end this module, I want to teach you one of the most powerful journey, journaling exercises um, that I've ever done that I currently do on a very consistent basis. Um, and it helps to make this flip. It certainly helps to anchor this once you've made the flip. And once again, it comes from the work of Esther Hicks, and it's uh, called a focus wheel. So I'm going to do one for you here, and then I'll have you do one of your own. Sure. You bet. So the premise of a focus wheel, the analogy that's given is it's like a merry-go-round that's going really fast. And you try to get on. Let's say your friends are on it. It's going super fast. You're trying to get on, but you can't get on. Okay, It just kind of throws you off. You're scared. Um, so the idea behind this is that when we make flips from, you know, disempowering thoughts to empowering thoughts, they're, it's hard to get up to speed with them. We don't believe them right away, and so then we think they're not believable. Does that make sense? When really all we need to do is just slow the merry-go-round down, get on it, and then speed it up. Okay? So this is a journaling exercise to help you do that. And it's truly transformed my life when I practice when I practice it on a regular, well, it has, and I continue to practice it on a regular basis because it has. So I'm going to use the thought, my body and I are on the same team. And you're going to draw a sun. And you can decide however many rays you want, depending on how long you want this to be, but we're going to fill each one, okay? So if you feel in bondage to your body, your body right now is your main persecutor, um, again, you either have the option of just surrendering and not feeling any different, or going to war with your body, right? So those are bondage thoughts. So a thought that would flip you into a freedom thought would be, instead of going to war, my body and I are on the same team, right? But if you are feeling this way, and you say this thought to yourself, you don't believe it, correct? It's too big of a shift. So this is like the merry-go-round going super fast. So what we're going to do is we're going to slow the merry-go-round down, and then we're going to work our way up to this thought, okay? And the way that we do that, and this is really important, is that we're going to write thoughts here that we already believe. Not ones you're stretching to. Ones you already believe that are in alignment with this thought. I'm going to say that one more time because it's really important. This thought is a stretch. These thoughts you believe. Okay? And so you probably have to go really, really, really general, almost maybe like embarrassingly general. So you might say, my heart beats when I sleep. I believe that. I can get up to speed with that thought. You might say, my fingernails grow on their own. My food gets digested. My body tells me when I need water. I get thirsty. And then you might think, well, I remember how Annalisa said the 
thirst mechanism in the human body is pretty weak. And so my body's actually trying to give me messages sooner. And you might say, well, I bet, I bet my body's sending me messages all the time. And you think, I like the idea of listening more. Any question pops into your mind, what could change for me if I did listen more? And then you think, it's exciting to see who I could be, what I could look like and feel like a few years from now if I did listen. That's the work. It looks weird. Seems like it's not worth your time. But can you see how you almost feel lighter just doing that, even if you didn't know that you were battling your body in this moment? Can you see how this thought is easier to believe? Once again, we think that if a thought feels unbelievable, that it's just untrue or we can never believe it. What's really happening is this, we haven't practiced this thought, so it's a stretch. It's the merry-go-round going really fast. But doing these things, practicing thoughts intentionally in alignment with this that we already believe get us up to speed. Make sense? Okay. I'm going to have you practice it. So here we have our main persecutors. Think about one that you would like to shift right now. And you might just say, my blank and I are on the same team. If a different thought feels good to you, that's fine too. So money and I are on the same team. Time and I are on the same team. That asshole at work and I are on the same team. Put his or her name, please, not asshole. OK? <laughs> So try that. If a different thought comes to you that you'd prefer to get up to speed with, do that. Make your son, and then think of general thoughts that could be in alignment. The stretch thoughts in a certain format. Because um, you know how we talked about inspiration is not like a destination. It's, it's a journey you're trying to get to. So like, for example, I was thinking about I'd probably pick something related to money. Hmm. And my initial thought was I have enough money to hmm. live on. Mm -hmm. That's a stretch thought for me. Mm -hmm. But then when I thought that, I already felt like that was a destination and not a, You're an so opener. Wise. You're so <laughs> yeah. wise. I would agree 100%. I think what you're trying to do is change your relationship with, not get something from. Does that make sense? Yes. So that your center thought is, like if you really thought of money as like an intimate partner, mm -hmm. changing your relationship with, not like, what could I get from my intimate partner? I'll make that the goal. Okay. You know? So instead of you're, you know, saying to your body, I bet I can manipulate you into being 30 pounds thinner, 
you just like my body and I are on the same team. And another important point, you, you're you probably going to do this a hundred times. <laughs> you're not going to do it once and then tomorrow it's likely you'll, you'll feel in bondage <laughs> to your body. I've done focus wheels on the exact same statement literally hundreds of times. Okay, so it's not like you have to come up with a new statement each time. You just have to identify what you feel persecuted by, flip it to being on the same team, and get up to speed with that in the moment. So this is about, again, creating different pathways in your brain. Take, see what you can do in three to five minutes. If you don't get done, that's fine. And then we'll discuss this module as a whole. But we don't want those statements around the center to be conditions, though, right? They can be conditioned. Oh, they can like, be conditioned. Like my heart beats when I sleep. Yeah. Okay. That you know that's a great point. Maybe this is a good distinction that you guys are helping me see. Maybe it's the conditions in the middle, as you're alluding to, Christina, is unconditional, is perspective, is relational. But you can use conditions around the center statement to remind yourself of things. So you might say, like, my, money and I are on the same team. And then you might, like, remember a thought of when um, you receive good money for something. So I, I think, does that distinction make sense? I think outside can be conditional or unconditional, but inside it's more of an unconditional statement. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Are you sure? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so we, we started by talking about the power of perspective. We went into bond, bondage and seduction and essentially the definition of responsibility that we have in our culture. And then we ended with this, that we often think we're being persecuted by, and we may be persecuted by uh, those things, but that when we think those things have power over us, essentially we stay stuck. So, that's a lot to talk about. Um, Curious to know, I guess, top insight with all of that. So take a second if you need to to look through. Anybody willing to share? Something that stood out to me, and again, there's a lot there. Um, if you take action without shifting your perspective, it becomes a vicious cycle. And I can boil that down to so many times in my life. I think about when my kids were young, and I'd end some days and go out and say to myself, I feel like all I did was stand in the middle of my kitchen and spin. Mm. <laughs> and so I can take that back to that vicious cycle of feeling like I have to do all these things to be this way insert whatever that is mm -hmm. and not taking the time to switch or shift my perspective and so I might take another action but I keep staying in that same cycle so that to me was you know, even they're, even though they're younger now I can still see that cycle playing out mm. mm -hmm. and that um, I love the whole section on self talk I just so understand all that. And the one thing that stood out to me is you can acknowledge and walk away. Hmm. Right? That Could I can you say more? Um, I'm not going to fall for bondages. Oh, yeah. I know what's going on. But am I ready at that point to claim power? Right. Or do I sometimes just go, And they, the, the five steps or whatever that you had there, the I feel crappy. There are many times where I'm like, yeah, I feel crappy. But then I don't necessarily, sometimes I even say, hey, family, I'm really crappy. <laughs> you might want to leave me alone for a few minutes. <laughs> but I think taking that next step of why am I crappy, right. I don't know that I am very good about doing. Right. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Like sometimes I think I'm crabby and then I'll just like 
change my condition, right? I'll just go somewhere else. You know, I'll you know, take the action, which is the temporary relief, you know, and it works. But then it's like, okay, but am I actually addressing or do I just get back on the stage just like that and the next day I'm crabby again? And right. What is the goal? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? But you, you're talking about power perspective and owning the power of perspective, and that owning me owning my own power or perspective takes nothing away from anyone else. Yeah, like it is. for me <laughs> you know, and, mm -hmm. yeah. but. and you, you could even uh, say that not doing that which would bring you into bondage mm -hmm. which is the dreaded drama triangle so you're either acting like a persecutor or a victim or a rescuer yeah. that not owning your own power adds a lot of drama to people's life mm -hmm. right Sure. You know, so not only does it not take away anything right. if you're owning your power, but it, when you don't do that, you logically could say you are taking away yes. things. And I just say that because sometimes we, you know, feel like to be powerful, we have the wrong definition of power, I guess, in our culture. Like we're manipulating someone mm -hmm. or power over. This is not power or over, this is empowered. Mm -hmm. I had a question. I had a question more for the mothers in the room, and this is something I have witnessed here at this retreat, and also with my friends. That, um, and it came up under the definition of responsibility that we should feel guilty and anxious. And I was like, that's what I see so happening to so many of my friends. And I even saw some of, like, I heard some of the language here too, mm -hmm. about like that feeling bad about taking time away or. Things yeah. like that, or it was in like remember those yesterday when we read you read through all of those things. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Do you think that's what's kind of happening with some of that? Is like society expects you to feel guilty and bad, and so then you do. I mean, is that part of it? And like, are we doomed then to experience that? I think that's what our culture promotes a lot. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And even yeah. like Christine, you were talking about how like the only time it's okay to take a nap is when you're a new mom, and then if you don't take it, you get criticized for that. Because they're like, oh, you should be you're taking it. When the baby you should, should be napping. <laughs> and you're like, oh, well, that would be nice if I had someone here. Too. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, yeah, it's like. It's Constant, like, yes. Right, it's like, okay, I can't. Criticism. Right. right. Yeah, right. You know, too. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a perspective thing that we need to change. Well, and I, no, I'm not a mother, so I don't know, but I would say, you know, of course you're not doomed we're not doomed just collectively but I think what you're alluding to um, is again if we default to cultural standards yeah. then we are right because that's just where our culture lives right now one day someday maybe it won't right. but right now our culture lives in a lot of dysfunction in regards to these things and so if we don't take power over our own lives to do something at a higher level then yeah mm -hmm. doomed to guilt and anxiety probably we pass it on to the kids. <laughs> Good news is they have their own power too. I know, right? Yeah, so I don't need to worry about them as much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just you. Right. Just me. Yeah. <laughs> Any other thoughts? How did the focus wheels go? Were they difficult? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Where did you get hung up? Um, I got hung up on it, where to even start what I was trying to work towards. Um, and this whole module for me has helped because something my therapist has said to me in the past is instead of saying, I know, but X, Y, Z, she said, change it to, I know, and what will I do instead? And so I said uh, being responsible gives me freedom from micromanagement and also the ability to choose. It opens up my options and empowers my world. It gives me the freedom to create. So wow, Christina. For me, 
it was trying to figure out what was the relationship that was in bondage and what was the persecutor and how could I work to change that relationship. So for me, it was money because as the sole income in my house and having a family to take care of and not liking the industry that I work in, I do a lot of times feel in bondage to money because I feel like I can't work somewhere else because nobody's going to hire me to do something else because of my academic background and my job background. Mm -hmm. So I thought, okay, but what is the relationship though? Mm -hmm. So I finally got to, I don't know if this is wrong or right, but my money works for me. Mm -hmm. And the whole time I'm doing this wheel, I can hear myself mm -hmm. saying, nope, that's not true. That's not true. That's not true. Mm -hmm. And I'm like fighting against myself. So it took going to really, really general and saying like money pays for all my things and money cannot spend itself hmm. for me to even get to a place where I could even connect it to me having an ability to do something with it. And I eventually got to, I can use my budget to define my life and I can use that definition of my life to make my money work for me. Wow. So it's definitely something I would need to practice. Thank you for sharing all that, though. Um, I think you bring up such a good point. With the focus wheels, the center statement and the first couple are the hardest. Yeah. So even I, sometimes what my husband and I will joke that sometimes once we get the first statement, like we're done, we feel better. Like yeah. we don't even have to because I have to work through like what's actually bugging me. And exactly. then when I can flip from what I don't want to what I do want, sometimes I can get up to speed with it quickly and I don't need to do it. Um, but when I can't, you're exactly right. Using the, or the first few are really challenging and you said it beautifully. Like in that case, you just have to get super general. Mm -hmm. Money is neutral. Mm -hmm. Just like statements about money. Like you said, money doesn't spend itself. Yeah. That's all. It's just statements about money, period. Yeah. My heart beats when I sleep, period. You know, you know what I'm saying? And so yeah. that's the key. If you're getting stuck, just more and more and more general. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Your will helped a lot. <laughs> Good. Anything else about focus wheels? One thing I will say, um, or share, I mean, Phil and I are really dorky, so <laughs> we did a, a few years ago, we did a focus wheel challenge with ourselves, so we mm -hmm. challenged ourselves to do one focus wheel a day together, and then talk about it. Wow. Um, and so we would take the thing that was bugging us most that day, and then we would do a focus wheel about it. And it was incredibly eye-opening and insightful, and... I, would th I think it was probably like day 18 or something. I woke up and I was just super anxious about something. And I was just literally going to pop out of bed and send emails out about this mm -hmm. thing. And because for the 17 days prior, I had practiced shifting my perspective. So literally nothing. We would take the thing that was bugging us most. We would change our perspective. And I saw how I felt better without doing anything. The thought that came to me was like, do a focus wheel first. And so I did that, and what ended up happening was I had a completely better idea as to how to solve the problem that was making me so anxious. Solved it in five minutes, bam, went on with my day. Awesome. And that essence has played out over and over and over again in my life. When I take the time to shift my perspective, I get different ideas. It's like what Albert Einstein says, you can't use the same level of thinking to actually solve a problem and so i think that's the power in this stuff is especially in the idea of focus wheels because i think for me i needed something i could tangibly do because it's, it's abstract right it's unseen it's perspective so this you know you put it to pen and paper there's a process around it um i know that i mean phil and i joke we say like well if nothing else, we always know we can do a focus wheel. Like we do, we, they, they've, they've made us feel better every single time. So regardless of what's happening, if we don't know how to solve a problem, we do a focus wheel. 
when we're in a really great place, we do a focus wheel before we try to solve the problem. <laughs> so that was actually what I was going to ask you is, do you ever do focus wheels from a place of freedom to get to a greater mm. inspiration? Yes. Well said. Yeah, I really do. Okay. Yep. So basically when you're just wanting to anchor something. Yeah. Yep. And you don't have to do it in this way. You know, you can, you could write it, just write out statements. I, I would say probably when I am in a place where I feel good and just want to feel better or anchor the good feeling, I might not do this because there's not a, like a thought I have to get up to speed with. Mm -hmm. It's more, I just write out thoughts that um, feel good and that are kind of along the same lines. There you go. With module four complete, it won't be nearly as easy for bondage to keep you stuck. If you haven't already, take a second to jot down your top insights and takeaways. You may also be interested in checking out the PDFs that correspond with the content from this module. These PDFs contain things like quotes and lists of books and other resources I've referenced throughout the last three videos. When you're ready, head over to the next video where we'll be looking at the wisdom and beauty of procrastination. See you over there, module five, lesson one.